Welcome. In the previous video, I have uh, shared meditations on the steps towards super intelligence, which is not a mathematical or super uneducated series of guesses, but those guesses are based on uh, in, independent research and my sense is that on a human scale, we may be pretty close to a, a reality that would be the equivalent of what is known as artificial general intelligence, which I call in, intelligence that is independent of a substrate. Only that that intelligence is going to be able to do a task or any task, whether it's cognitive or mechanical, um, at the very least those two, uh, that and a human can do that intelligence would be able to do this. Now steps, uh, sorry, uh, conversation specifically to consciousness itself. I feel that's a deeper topic, which I'm not going to elaborate on because my views on that topic are very, uh, they're, they're just beginning to like, uh, I, I don't, the consciousness is a different topic. Uh, historical leaders are two kind of at least binary set of thoughts with regards to consciousness existing and it's uh, possibly unlimited man man uh, like forms and uh, what have you whereas the other school thought is that consciousness doesn't exist in this kind of uh, the sense that we uh, equate it to be whereby consciousness uh, either doesn't exist the way we explain it, or it's a uh, it's a series of uh, um, pattern recognizers, or uh, if you can, mechanistic functions, uh, whichever realm they may be on, on the synaptic level or uh, deeper than that, like a quantum microtubule level. So there's like different schools of thought on how consciousness emerges and like the actual nature of consciousness i think it's a it's a it's a deeper topic because i'm i'm like halfway through a book written by a fellow named russell tart and i'm not going to talk about that because that wasn't going to be the focus of today's topic so i'm going to stick with building up on the meditations from the 8th of uh, sorry the 8th, uh, november the 8th uh, primarily these two videos and uh uh, if you haven't, I would encourage you, to, if you are interested, watch part one of that talk and then part two, where I uh, kind of share a model uh, that I've created. So I've, I've spent a little bit more time thinking about the first model, uh, which is this one. Uh, this this is a model too, um, but I need to, this model is almost a decade old, so I need to go back and refine it. Um, but primarily this is the model I talk about in those two set of videos, uh, with regards to steps to super intelligence and, uh, maybe it makes sense to, I got some comments there so you can just ignore them. That's just a reminder to myself. So I'm not going to explain this model again, um, but, uh, that's what the, what the two videos are for. Uh, as I've shared in that video or those, those two videos, I modified Sarah Seeger's equation, uh, whom I do not know personally. And this is a very bad attempt at modifying the equation to fit what I, I'm beginning to think about. Um, so segue into the other two videos that I've posted in the past three weeks or so. And... Uh, um, my, my, my sense is if I can draw a diagram is that with, uh, with more, I'm going to change the code with, uh, what am I doing here? Uh, I don't want the eraser. I want the line. So I think with better tools, unless like, I'm not going to explore this from a consciousness angle. Um, so yeah, with, with better tools, we're going to be able to get to more data and there's going to be insights captured within that data. So 
uh, already um, uh, there's a lot of data that we have collected uh, in our existence uh, here in the sense of uh, in the civilizational sense. Uh, so there are insights uh, within that data set. And uh, it, it looks like, um, so that's, that's one part, right? So the other part to that is that this is in a second, uh, actually it's not like that, it's written. There's a really good book, it's called The Second Machine Age, which I have read. It's been a while since I read the book. And uh, the uh, my writing is not so great here. Maybe if I write like this. Uh, so if I recall correctly, you have uh, they don't they don't talk about this right now. But right now we they don't talk about this in the book, but. Right now we are in a scarcity based environment. I'm gonna talk I'm gonna talk about this later. I wasn't I wasn't planning to, but right now we are in a scarcity based environment which uh, exclusively leads to a lot of uh, negative sum games. Negative sum games. Okay. That means in a nutshell, the way I understand it, uh, somebody's loss equals somebody else's gain, right? Uh, I don't know if I'm representing this correctly mathematically, but but that's that's my understanding of a negative sum game. So in a in a scarcity based um, now, in an abundance, uh, like this is, it's a couple of different questions. Like, first question is, can you have a positive sum game uh, in a scarcity-based environment? That's question one. Um, the other question is one of abundance, and is the degree to which we are going to? Sounds like I'm emphasizing on the word dance. That's not intentional, but is the degree to which we are going to? Uh, experience abundance. So there's a fair bit of evidence to suggest that the world's on a path towards abundance, um, most notably through the data collected and uh, shared through the World Economic Forum in the form of predictions that there is no, there are not going to be any more poor countries by the year 2035, and that doesn't factor in the fastening levels of progress. Um, but the question is one of what kind of realities are going to be uh, experienced in a world of increasing abundance? And does a increasing world of abundance automatically translate into positive sum games, right? So I don't know if I'm explaining, I'm thinking about this right, uh, but this is like something that comes to my mind. Like, the making of this comment ought not to suggest that automatic abundance equals nirvana or like this has to be thought through. Uh, as Richard Dawkins once said, we need to think about the design of society and culture, paraphrased. Uh, he didn't exactly say it like this. And uh, I, I feel like care should be placed at the, at, at the center of all developments, uh, amongst other things. Now, so that's one range of thoughts. The other range of thoughts is this: this wasn't in the context of second machine. Age, so I, 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 I don't want to represent it as something that Andrew McAfee and Eric Brittany Olson would have spoken about. And I don't remember seeing a diagram here. But um, how should we? So it wasn't necessarily in an adversarial sense, but one of the keen takeaway from um, 
from the book itself, which has been written, I think, almost a decade ago, is that if you have a human competing with a machine, like the question is, why are, is a human competing with a machine? Is it a negative sum game? Like is a scarcity-based model? Like why would a human uh, even compete with a machine, right? As other a lot of other questions like we humans are also machines. Uh, it just took a really long time for us to evolve biologically, um, and then uh, more time for brains to evolve and kind of open. But but in in a in a second machine age sense, uh, human versus machine results into the machine winning almost every time. So this is becoming more apparent. Obviously. Humans cannot keep pace with a mechanical robot. Mechanical robot can be installed in a factory. It's going to be working all day without any breaks uh, and the efficiencies of the roof on every scale. The same phenomenon is going to be uh, witnessed in the world of uh, cognition as more time passes by. But it's not a competition like the uh, so anyway so. So to come back to the second machine age, they found out through studies that when they pair a human plus a machine versus machines, machine or machines, right? Then the this 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 segment now which now looks like a toast. <laughs> uh, no, that, that was not intentional. Uh, this this segment here wins every time, okay? This segment here wins every single time, or like statistically, this is bound to be uh, a lot more. Uh, it's it's the the, uh, the, the favor, the, 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 the results are in the favor of this combination versus machines themselves now there's a couple of different angles to this i'm not going to go through like i'm not an expert in this area so i'm not going to talk too much about this uh one is the level of autonomy um like the steps towards agi and like beyond agi like i don't even know if that's on topic but that's like one one other thing that comes to mind is the second machine age uh the next segue is uh, towards, I don't know why I started talking about the second machine. I don't have a script right now. Uh, I was talking about the tools leading to data. There are insights to be gleaned. Ah, now machines so far do have a better, um, machine learning seems to be quite effective at, at finding patterns within the data set. Um, now the question is, how is this going to evolve? And I think there's yet another series of meditations here. Um, I, I personally feel is going to evolve in a richer sense that increasing human and machine uh, collaboration uh, to put it succinctly, is going to result in, uh, it's beyond imagination, like what could come out of that. Um, because humans have been quite adept at leveraging machines to, to drive progress up until this point in time. And there's a history behind that. So I won't go to the history itself. Again, not my area of expertise, but We've, we've kind of like done, we've, we've gathered knowledge and uh, we've done so in the sense that we have individuals working as teams, right? And then you've got many clusters of that happening on, on the time scale, right? So however the arc of progress is looking like, I think it's maybe starting to look like this. I don't know where we are exactly. Uh, depends how you, like what variables you choose to draw the graph. But we've got individuals in different capacity and we've collaborated uh, for thousands of years to unearth new knowledge, 
and uh, or or gather new knowledge, and we have different tools like the scientific method. Scientific method, right? That graph does not represent the scientific method, by the way. Although 90% of the scientists that are ever alive are alive today, so I guess it depends how you look at it. Um, but th this is like by far the best tool that we have. Uh, oops. Uh, invented or stumbled upon, I don't know. Um, and my understanding of the scientific method is, uh, if I could make it simple, you have a hypothesis, you do uh, an experiment. I'm not going to write the whole thing. In order to validate your hypotheses or reject it, right? And uh, you have new findings, and based on those findings, you repeat the method. And once this is, uh, there's another, there's other things to that as well, like peer review and what have you. Well, once there's some body of evidence that uh, uh, validates or refutes the hypotheses, then anyone anywhere, um, how do you select them? Okay. So I can't send it to that person. So you, you can you can you can uh, you can oh sorry that's the name of the planet that's in there. That was not intentional. Um I'm gonna copy this. You can you can uh, how do you move this? You can validate that experiment having another team anywhere, another, any part of the, like any given part of the world, uh, conduct the same experiment to reach the same conclusions. And so this is the, I would feel as a non-scientist, the most effective way of unearthing uh, new knowledge you you leverage this method to find new knowledge. Um, yeah, this is getting a little abstract. Um, so to come back to the first slide, uh, there are insights that are waiting to be found because uh, machines are sifting through the data that humans have collected uh, over all this time. I don't know why this is not working. It's the virus. Fine. And uh, the machines are sifting through this data set, finding unique and possibly interesting correlations between the data set. And so that there are, there, 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 now as this, as this happens, I think there's a new angle and that is the level of autonomy, right? So there's tools we make uh lead to the gathering of data and uh the tools have some increasing level of autonomy this autonomy uh is not decreasing it's only increasing autonomy right and not autonomy um like I said earlier, uh, specific to the robots in a mechanical sense, the autonomy is increasing. And specific to the tools that are being developed uh, that are replicating or, sorry, uh, rep not, not replacing, but uh, uh, performing the functions that a mind would perform. Um, the tools are getting increasingly adept at that. And uh, as humans and machines interact in a richer set of ways, it's invariable that new insights are going to be gained, right? 
So as always, there is an ethics angle to all this. And once again, I would say ethics is at the heart of everything we do. I think I can type this. It's going to be faster. Right? Ethics are at the heart of everything that we do. Well, it did work, but then I can erase this one. I should have done this ahead of time. All right. So, like the question is who's ethics, right? Uh, I think Kurzweil said this, and as others may have said this too. That's a valid question. Okay, shifting gears. As we develop new tools, and these tools are being deployed to sift through the data, we're finding new insights. Everyday new insights are being found. So the rate of progress is, there's two schools of thought here. One, one we go back to the classic conversation, the rate of progress is not that much. Or it has plateaued, or it has gone in the reverse direction. Um, possibly the other end of the argument is that the rate of progress is exponential. Uh, so maybe there are other narratives also, or you can totally redefine this kind of uh, narrative for lack of a better word. So specific to this model so far, if I can call this a model, uh, there are there are new reports coming out that there's phenomena that's being observed from all, like the, the, the now this is going to take like a more of a uh, astronomy kind of uh, kind of sense, um, but um, like at least related to two videos that I made in the past three weeks. Uh, one was specific to. Um, well, they're specific to events. I was kind of thinking, like, why would this happen? And so if you look at uh, those two videos, uh, there was a one news item related to uh, the star system called uh, ASASSN-21. Uh, I think that's a Q or a G. I can't tell. Um, let's find out. That looks like a G to me. No, that's a Q. QJ, okay? So this star system, memory service is like 1,800 light years, still in the Milky Way. Uh, there were two Neptune kind of like planets, like they were icy planets, which collided, which then created this disk around the star system, which is called the Synestia. And it looks like kind of like a donut shape and uh, led to the massive dimming of the star system itself. Like I think it's as much as 50%. The other, the other item was uh, about a gamma ray burst. But I was also thinking about uh, Beetlejuice. And I updated the notes for one of the videos, I think this video. And uh, I was thinking about Beetlejuice like yesterday or... Today, I started thinking about it again, but um, I hope the video doesn't start playing because I don't want it to. But uh, Beetlejuice is, like, roughly speaking, um, uh, less than 650 light years away. So I, was, I, started, I started thinking about... Um, like uh this is going to go in a different direction at this point so maybe i should use another well just i think it's going to be all related to one video so i can just put it all in one board but i was now thinking this is going in a, again different direction um how do you draw a circle well i'll just draw it like this so if this was the supermassive black hole sagittarius a star towards the center of the Milky Way, the massive, the most massive object we know of in the Milky Way, Milky Way now, because the, there's another 
thing I also mentioned in that video, which is a gamma ray burst, which is in another galaxy. In that case, that galaxy is almost a billion with a B light years away. Whereas the Milky Way is only 120,000 uh, or 100, and, 100 to 120,000. I forgot to add the K in the last video. Uh, light years across. So if this was the entire Milky Way, right? It would be around 100 light years across. So 60,000 light years here, 60,000 light years there, right? And uh, so if, once again, if the solar system is here, then relative to the size of the Milky Way, these events are not that far from us. Uh, depends how you look at it. I mean, we're talking light years, and we have no technology to uh, even, uh, I don't even know if we have a laser that we could um, beam towards, um, say we had some preemptive warning that something's going to happen to Beetlejuice, or uh, assassin, like what, how are you say uh, well, it looks like assassin, but ASASSN-21 uh, QJ, right? Say we had some preemptive warning uh, that this is going to result into a, the, the explosion that's going to create the synestia. And uh, on the flip side, uh, Beetlejuice is going to uh, blow its so-called top off, right? Relative to our uh, view. Um, so if we did have that knowledge and like, I mean, even if we could send a signal, it would still take this amount of time for the signal to get there. Right. And there's like a lot of other questions of that nature. Um, and it would take, uh, I think this is, this star system is like 1800 light years across. So. Like, I don't even know how we do that, right? So, like, from from our vantage point, it, it, I don't know how you you do that. But like, if you could send some preemptive warning, how do you get the message about it? Like, there's no such thing as faster than uh, no transmission of information faster than the speed of light. At least I don't know of this of this uh, method. Um, so. Yeah, in the previous video, I kind of meditate on this, the two videos that I've made, uh, that relative to the size of the Milky Way, not the universe, the Milky Way, the galaxy that we are, that the solar system is part of, uh, these events are not that far from us. So like if this represented the entire area or, or like area, not the volume of the Milky Way, um, then you know, and this, this, I don't know if I explained this well in the last video. So this represents 100%. This is 50%. So this quadrant would be 25%. So relative to us, is it's not that far. I think I did the math. And it's like, I forget, like, I can't recall the top of my head. It's like relative to the size of the Milky Way, these events are pretty close. Was the, the question I was asking is why? Like, why did they happen? And I found some information specific to uh, thinking this event, uh, and it had to do with the. Oh, it's right here actually. The article. The, there's a good article I found on Universe Today, and it says that um, the gas component in the protoplanetary disk was largely removed, and its removal makes collision like this more likely. So I haven't had a chance to go through the Wikipedia article of protoplanetary disk. But the question I had is, why? Like, first of all, what exactly? I mean, I can, I, I've got a surface level understanding uh, of what a protoplanetary disk could be. Um, but why would the... Why would the... Like, 
I guess the reduced levels of, of protoplanetary disk uh, result into increased probability of collisions between planets. Um, maybe they maybe they move around the star system um, that much more like relatively faster because they don't have I don't know they don't have mass through push through um, so it's like it's whatever the gravitational pull of the star is they're just kind of going around it but um I think in the same article by Universe Today it highlights that something similar happened to Earth uh, in its initial kind of uh, when it was younger, because uh, Earth is I forget how many billions of years old now, but the Moon collided into Earth uh, billions of years ago. And I think it's called Theia at that time. And um, obviously, this would have been a cataclysmic event. Uh, so I haven't looked at the timelines of what kind of life forms existed on Earth at that time. Uh, like, if there was any life at all, like, was it like photosynthetic life or what have you? But Thea, at that time, I think the moon was called Thea, it was a protoplanet, and it collided into Earth. And I, one of the things they highlight in the article you know, from Universe Today is that that the this star system is experiencing what Earth experienced uh, billions with a B years ago. ago. Uh, so, yeah. So shifting gears once again, um, I would think as we put more instruments. Um, better instruments both in the realm of observatories telescopes like i don't even know i forget what the next gen telescope is um uh former senior nasa scientist jim green i think is the name he used to attend some rooms in clubhouse when clubhouse used to be somewhat anyway so but um he was talking about some next gen telescopes and projects but um so again in this realm in this sense we have the telescope itself but we also have the autonomy so however the data is collected that's one part but then what happens with the data and what kind of machine learning models are applied to that data set and how are humans and machines collaborating uh in order to be able to find insights within that data set Right. So these questions emerge. Um, so shifting gears, um, this is a reality. This happened a billion light years away, not again in the Milky Way. Right. Uh, this is a reality. Uh, something's going on with Beetlejuice for sure. We don't know what exactly. Uh, but something's up. Um, and same here, right? In this case, it's dimming. I think in this case, in this case it was brightening, if, if I remember correctly. I've made other notes here, too. Uh, looks like this is an interesting observatory. Uh, it keeps coming up in uh, uh, block flows. Huh? It's, we even made a block flows back in 2021, and the Vera C. Rubin Observatory was uh, mentioned here. Um, okay, so phenomena may be happening all around us. It's like the question is the degree to which. Where's the tab I want to bring now? So I, I noticed somewhere it was highlighted that. On average, we are looking at one gamma ray burst detected every day. Um, these are the sources, so that, and that's the search string. 
I don't know about the site itself. That's an official site for Hubble. Um, well, this looks to be like a NASA website. Well, this says one per day if you were able to watch the entire sky all the time. I don't know what that means. Because relative to our, like how much of the night sky could, the uh, like this is shifting gears. But if this is Earth in a, like now we're talking about scales, right? So Earth in uh, a, in the in the sense of a local, um, I mean, Earth is the speck, even in the sense of uh, like if this was the the Centauri system uh, or the st stellar uh, kind of masses close to the Sun, the capital S, like the Sun we see in the sky. Uh, all the stars are Sun, right? Unless they're planets like Jupiter or what have you. Um, but Earth is like we're talking we're talking scales now, like different scales. But continuing on how expansive the universe is, like we may not see the, we, we only can sense like the observable universe with like newer instruments like James Webb. But the universe could be a lot more expansive than the observable universe. And if stuff is actually uh, expanding, faster than the speed of light that's some like i don't know how this actually happens but there are parts of the universe that have been observed where galaxies are moving away from each other faster than the speed of light and i i don't know much about this but it said to understand this you need to learn about astronomy and uh astro like i don't know how much of astrophysics is applied here um but um Space can expand faster than the speed of light. We know nothing can travel. Well, that's what, 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 what like, it's, it's like, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to invoke the quantum stuff, but information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. And I'm not going to get into quantum teleportation and stuff like that. I don't understand that. Uh, like how the particles replicate the spin state and what have you. And if something like that could be in uh, leverage in the future in order to be able to transmit information. But uh, based on, um, like, it, it, I, don't, I don't know if there's a way to transmit uh, information faster than the speed of light uh, in a classical sense. Um, so there could be a lot more events like gamma ray bursts and also events that have been observed like Beetlejuice recently and this one. Uh, this could, like the question is, what do events like these uh, represent? So if this was a single, say this was Beetlejuice, something weird is happening with it, right? I don't know how you actually denote that. But this could be one of many, many, many such occurrences whereby a normal behavior of a uh, body is observed, but it's st statistically uh, a huge anomaly for uh, a body to ex exhibit the, the, the thing it, it is doing, like whether it's dimming, or whether it's brightening. And so there must be reasons why it's doing that. And that's just one set of uh, events. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've spoken too much about this, but uh, but, but my point is like, my, 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 my point is, um, I'm not gonna get into a lot of like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, I'm not going to get into universes and par parallel universes 
possibility of universes, like big universes bumping into larger universes or the other way around. Um, and beyond that, I will, I will, I will stop there. But um, just in the universe alone, like, like I think James Webb is uh, starting to shed some light that now we're talking about the scale of the universe. So I don't know how you would pick, like how you would depict the shape of the universe, but whatever the shape is, it is uh, so far in the tens of billions of years. Uh, it's not uh, 120,000 light years for the Milky Way. It is now in the billions uh, of light years across. Billions. It's in the tens. Um, hey, that looks like a face. That was not intentional. <laughs> uh, I, I just I, I forget exactly, uh, but I think James Webb is starting to shed some light that the universe could be more expansive than uh, previous estimates. And Lord Martin Rees, actually a picture who uh, somebody who is not familiar, is a British um, scientist and uh, well educator. Um, I've yet to read a book by Lord Martin Rees, but I just wonder. I want to like, uh, yeah, that's uh, Lord Rees is of the like he, one of the things he talks about is if I if I understand it correctly, he's like he explains it like this. He's like, uh, I don't know if I'm able to capture the essence of what he's trying to. Ah, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, he, he he is this still recording? Yeah. Well, he says uh, that, say, this is the, this is the ship, right? And way off in the distance, say, that's the horizon. Just imagine, right? So Lord Greece uses this analogy in order to be able to, um, um, say that if you were standing on the surface of the ship, then you would see like here till the edge of the horizon. So relative to your uh, line of sight, this would be the horizon. Now, if the same individual was standing on a mass, and imagine this mast is, I don't know, just imagine, now, we're not talking about the same scale, but just imagine he doesn't get into this much detail. But imagine this mast is, um, I don't know, if the stratosphere is um, I don't know, 50 kilometers, like something like that. Yeah, right. Even if this thing was two kilometers uh, uh, long, I think I'm getting into too much detail. So now this person is standing here, right? So I didn't explain it well. So they would they would see farther. Let's put it this way. So the horizon would now appear to be somewhere over maybe here, right? And that wouldn't be 50 kilometers. I don't know why I put that there. But the range would extend. Right, I think that's the right word. Range. The range would extend. Right. Uh, the range would extend. So, so the whole. I think you should listen to Lord Rees on this topic. But the point is that the universe could be a lot more extensive. We've we've collected data from our position here, wherever we, we happen to be in the universe. And from our vantage point, the universe looks to be that much expansive. It's like billions of year, light years across. We think it's maybe uh, 14 billion light years across, or I don't, know, maybe, I don't know what the updated number is. I think 16 billion or more, but it could be 25 billion. It could be 80 billion or more, who knows? So this then, feeds into what I was referring to, that 
when we see events like this happen, little Jews, assassin, and what have you, then going back to, again, better tools, increased autonomy, more data, more human and machine collaboration, the, the number of such events that are going to be observed could be a lot higher. So I'll use an actual example here. I don't know if there's a good example or a bad example, but I went out for a walk the day after Halloween and it was after sunset and I saw some candy on a driveway. Now, imagine that this was you just for a moment. You are an alien. You land on a foreign kind of completely alien planet, right? You can kind of become transparent, uh, invisible, what have you. But you see this phenomena. You're like, oh, yeah, people have houses, they have driveways, they have cars. But you see this candy on the driveway. And you see like two or three packets of it, right? Now, that's a statistical anomaly. But imagine you could somehow capture data from the entire planet. And so the, the key point is that you landed on the day after the event on this planet. Now, that event of the candy being on the floor represents some anomaly. Like you are not expecting these phenomena because when you do a statistical analysis around this planet, you find out that this is prevalent or has occurred on more driveways than usual. Now, if only you could go back in time just by a day, this is a, this is a metaphor, right? Or uh, it's a, Hey, so uh, if you could go back just by a day, you would notice that there was an event and there was a lot of such events happening whereby the probability that they're going to see some residual or some effect. Like you could, you, you might want to categorize as, as an anomaly, but in fact that there's a very good reason why that thing happened and that was the event the day prior where hundreds of millions of uh, these beings these children of the alien like from your perspective you would be the children of these aliens uh, so for some reason they go out and collect candy so basically long story short uh the 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 observed event of that one uh single event could be representative of a lot of such events out there and and so it is the case with events like Beetlejuice and other events uh, where, whereby uh, as well as uh, possibly other events uh, some of which we've yet to categorize there could be a lot of gamma ray bursts out there right are they going to impact us that's another conversation uh, I think there's a another article I was just reading that uh, Actually, this one was just released uh, today, today. Yeah, this one was released today. Uh, as a, the cosmic ray that hit uh, Earth around the Utah region, I think this was. Um, well, the I haven't read this whole thing, but this uh, the detector is in Utah. So it didn't hit Utah, it was the detector is in Utah. But... Uh, um, you haven't read this article, so I won't talk about that. But um, these events could be happening all around us, relatively close to us, uh, as in the Milky Way, but also all around the universe, right? There's different kind of events. Uh, gamma ray bursts are happening at least once a day in the observable universe, which is massive. Uh, the probability that they're going to impact us is pretty low. Uh, sorry, I don't know what the probability is. I, I think that's a, that's a different question. So now I'm going to shift gears again. So now I'm going to talk about the Drake's equation. 
and the Drake's equation. I've actually I have a video on Drake's equation. So if you go to my uh, page on YouTube. It's actually a really, really easy uh, equation, probably one of the easiest equations uh, to understand. But if you go to my YouTube page and search for Drake, then there's a super simple explanation um, via this video that I created. Um, and uh, yeah, but I mean, if you just spend a couple of minutes on the Wikipedia page for Drake's equation, it's, it's it's super easy to understand. It's just uh, the probability of uh, finding active communicating civilizations uh, or intelligences in the universe. If, yeah, don't think it's yes yeah, universe. Um, so there is a tool. Uh, we're gonna shift gears. There is a tool on the BBC.com website. Here's the link. And let's tinker with this tool. So it's, it's a tool whereby they've taken the Drake's equation and made a tool out of it. It was basically taking a bunch of different probabilities and combining them together. Um, ah, here it is. Oh, it's in the galaxy. Okay, I stand correct. I thought it was the universe. Okay. Well, you could extend it to the entire universe. That's pretty easy. So, because there's um, observed to be a hundred, uh, sorry, two trillion galaxies in the universe. Two trillion galaxies, right? I think uh, from from the result of what I'm about to say next, we might be getting ahead of ourselves because um, we may never ever communicate with some of these intelligences. Uh, both from the perspective of how far away they, they may be, but also from the perspective of the evolution. Like they could be slightly more advanced than us, like however you look at that. And uh, it would be like the equivalent of the difference between us and chimpanzees. Like we would be the equivalent of chimpanzees as Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of makes this correlation or this uh, analogy. Um, well, let's think a little bit of this tool. So, uh, the number of stars born in each, uh, number of new stars born each year in the Milky Way, about 10. That's a, uh, I don't know if that's a low number or a high number because the Milky Way is a, uh, is estimated to have a hundred billion with a B star systems. So if this was the Milky Way, which is 120,000 light years across. It has a hundred billion with a B, hundred billion at the very least star systems. And we've only uh, cataloged, and I don't even know if we've named all of them. We only cataloged 1% of them. So like 1 billion is through a, a project called the Gaia, uh, not G Craig. Uh, GAIA. It's through the European Space Agency. Um, I think that's the most extensive catalog. Uh, I have no idea how that works. Just trying to spend like barely five minutes trying to tinker with their tools. And, um, yeah. But yeah, so continuing on the fact that there's at least 100 billion star systems in the Milky Way. Um, I don't know how it works, how gas and dust is created and how all that results into the formation of new stars. 10 stars being created each year seems like a very low number to me. Well, let's go with that. Um, I honestly don't know how you just deduce this probability that the percentage of stars with planets must equal 50%. Uh, I don't know how you, like there, there would be a set of, um, can draw on top of that, but there must be a set of inputs driving this phenomena itself. Just this phenomena, this green kind of inverted triangle. Um, so there's like a whole series of thought about the further evolution of the Drake's equation, like more like a 3D represent, representation of a Drake's equation. 
but there are inputs for the per percent of stars with planets. That seems like a high number to me, right? I mean, there's no guarantee that 50% of all the stars in the Milky Way have planets. That's, if the estimates are right, 50 billion uh, stars in the Milky Way that have planets. On the flip side, this could be a lower probability because it could be the fact that 90% of the uh, stars in the Milky Way have some planets around them, right? So um, I don't know. I'll, 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 I'll be a little more conservative and I would drop this number down. Let's drop it down more to like 30%, okay? I honestly don't know. Like I said, they, they, there would be inputs that would determine what number of stars. I, I think looking at the Gaia data set, once again, we could at least come up with approximation, right? So Gaia has mapped 1% of this estimated um, data, uh, like uh, estimated, uh, uh, we estimated there's 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. So look at the data set from the present, like the one one billion uh, stars that have been, uh, I don't know if catalog is the right word, but are in the Gaia system. We could come up with some approximations and those approximations could help. That would be like one of the inputs towards trying to come up with a more educated uh, estimate of the number of stars that actually have planets going around them. Uh, there's also this a question of real planets. Um, it's hypothesized that there are more real planets uh, versus uh, actual planets. So if you have, say, uh, 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, on average, each star has just, let's say, four or five planets per star system. So that's like half a trillion, uh, 400 billion to half a trillion with a T planets, if I'm doing my math, my math right, right? So, uh, but it's estimated there's actually more rogue planets. I forget if it's in the Milky Way or in the interstellar space between galaxies, but it's estimated there's a lot more rogue planets versus actual planets orbiting some kind of star. So I'm going to leave that there and just kind of classify. It's getting messier here. Uh, but let's come back to the Drake's. I hope I don't run out of space on my Dropbox um, because I only have a gig left. Oh, well, let's keep going. Oh, I can always do part two. So where was I? Uh, I was here. So the next section is the average number of habitable planets per solar system. I got a little bit of contention with this part of the Drake's equation uh, because when they say habitable um, like uh, planets, um, they're really talking about the Goldilocks zone. Uh, so the, we're making an assumption that the exoplanets. Exoplanet is a planet that's in a star system that's not in the solar system, right? That's my understanding of exoplanets. But the uh, assumption that's being made here is that the life form that is, uh, it, it exists somewhere out there uh, is kind of like us. But even on Earth, we find enough evidence. We see like shrimp living near volcanic vents. We have creatures living in the Arctic. And th this is a huge temperature variable. So I don't like what the temperature is near the volcanic vents. But I would assume it gets pretty hot. So they evolved in a different environment, more hotter, more acidic. Uh, and they've been evolving there for uh, hundreds of millions, not billions of years, at least hundreds of millions of years because they, they were in some preliminary form even uh, 60 million years ago when we had a massive extinction on the planet with the uh, Chicxulub kind of crater. Uh, I'm pretty sure sh shrimps existed around that time, maybe in some slightly modified forms from an evolutionary pers perspective too. I think that's a somewhat... Uh, anyway, so 
but yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of issue with this section, um, but um, I think further evolution of the Riggs equation should be uh, should be an ongoing debate. I think uh, there was an event last year or the year before, in the past two or three years, and uh, Dr. Martin Rotblatt was part of the panel. I, 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 I was trying to see if there was a virtual event, uh, but I couldn't. Anyways, I don't know Dr. Martin Rotblatt personally, by the way. I do not know her. Um, so we're making the assumption here that the average number of habitable planets per solar system is 2.5. I don't know, once again, if this number is high or low. Um, I've already offered my critique that I have, a, I have an issue with the model itself. I'm still going to drop this number down to uh, less than one. So I'm going to make it like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what that would really mean. That you only have half a planet for a solar system. Uh, I guess what this would mean is that uh, not all the planets uh, in across all the stellar masses in a Milky Way would have planets in the habitable zone. Okay, so just with these set of variables, uh, so far the number of planets in the habitable zone across the Milky Way just this galaxy is 45 billion okay now uh next drake assumed that all earth-like planets develop organic life um, but there's some criticism for that so this is the chance a habitable planet develops life uh i would let's drop it down considerably can i just edit this no i'm gonna to have to click on this a lot so i'm gonna drop it down from whatever number it was to a very low number like let's say it's extremely rare i wish i could put decimal percentages here but the lowest number i can go with is like only one percent of uh planets It's taking the sum of these variables, by the way. So it's not 1% of 1 billion. Sorry, if it was actually 1% and say there were five planets, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's feeding into this section is, this section is feeding into this. So we're taking 1% of 45 billion, right? And then that section is feeding into the chance that life develops intelligence. Uh, the tool is automatically going with 100%. I'm going to once again drop it down to 1%. So if I drop, I'm taking a 1%, there was 1% here already, and I dropped it down to uh, the probability that whatever number is emerging so far only 1% of that develops intelligence. So this is coming to 0 billion, but that is not 0. It just means it, the number is not in billions. So next, uh, again, if I could drop it down to uh, decimal places, I would do that. Chance that life can communicate across space. Uh, does this mean lasers or maybe some other form of communication that or radio or or some other communication that we've yet to uh, make sense of um, I would I would I would say if if I would make the assumption if I can I would say that if somehow life is I don't know how the great filter works but if somehow life has developed intelligence uh, so you know there's a question of what intelligence that's a good question they show an and here I really feel ants are incredibly intelligent, right? And if something happened to humans, different scale, then I, I feel like based on evidence so far, it's probably going to be meerkats or some other form of mammals or maybe some other creature that is going to be the evolutionary um, successor to the next tool-making 
computer making uh, species that is going to emerge on this planet. Because what happened on Earth is we have evidence to suggest that because if it's uh, if the Milky Way is um, well, it's 120,000 uh, light years across. That's the Milky Way, right? And and typically it takes uh, the sun um, if it's going around the supermassive black hole, then. I think it's like 260 million years now. Okay. The universe is 120,000 light years across. That's the time that it takes light. If you could somehow shine a very powerful laser from one end of the universe, sorry, the galaxy, the Milky Way, to the other end, <coughs> excuse me, it would take light, 120 light years to get to the other side. But now we're talking about the rate at which the solar system is moving to the Milky Way. And it's obviously not moving at the speed of light, not even close to it. I don't even think it's 1% of the speed of light. Relative to like how our cars and whatnot move, it may be moving very fast. But anyway, so I actually don't know uh, the the speed at which uh, the, the universe uh, moves. At all. But obviously, we can see we're talking about a different scale because that's in uh even light sorry light moves very fast so light is traversing this distance in approximately 120,000 years but it's taken the universe sorry it's taken the solar system 260 million years to do a loop around the uh, supermassive black hole so roughly speaking it would take like 60 65 or about 70 less than 70 million years let's let's put it this way like if the solar system was here and then it it was to traverse here, right? Say we're not here right now, we're somewhere here, right? We're somewhere here. And when the solar system was here, and obviously Earth is going around the solar system, then if you kind of could turn the dial back somehow and you have the, the Earth at like here, uh, this is the position right it, turning the dial back on time if you go back here this is where the dinosaurs would be this is 66 million years dinosaurs okay 66 million years dinosaurs were here and now a new species has emerged on earth and what happened is that 66 million years ago there was an event at the yucatan peninsula uh yucca Yucatan Peninsula, and that event is called Chicxulub, and uh, uh, it was a major extinction event on the planet. Um, and evidence suggests, I think it's more than ninety percent of all the life got wiped out, and all the life that you see around you, uh, in its incredible diversity. Um, the plants, the trees, the insects, the, the, the animals, the birds, all the sea creatures, all everything, the, the bacteria, what have you, all of this life form that has remained is only a fraction. I think it's between 1 to 10% uh, of the life that has survived that one event. And maybe uh, it seems a little... Uh, sensational is when I'm putting all these stuff in one basket but that's not my intention so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a break because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of storage here and I'm going to download this and then do part two so stay tuned um, part two should be on the channel so if you don't if it doesn't show up automatically just go back and click on the videos and it should be there we will see you in part two.